This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Hello, we're going to talk about IES 19 employee benefits. This was really written to sort out accounting for pension plans. The employer might decide or might be forced to set up a pension scheme for their staff so that when they retire, they've got some kind of income. There's a lot of jargon associated with this. Again, in practice, you don't have to get very stressed about the jargon because the jargon would be dealt with by an actuary. So the actuary who comes in and values the pension would come to you and say, the so-and-so cost is this. You just have to recognise the word, whatever it is, so-and-so cost, and decide where to put it. As you know, by now, recognition in the accounts means that some things are recognised in P&L, some things in OCI, some things in the balance sheet, some things elsewhere in reserves. That's what we need to sort out. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. Jargon first. The pension plan itself will normally be set up as a separate entity. And you can see these words here that I've used. Contributions and benefits. So what I'm going to do is just start by drawing a little bit of a diagram to represent this. So let's assume that we've got a company. Um, a famous sausage stuffing company. I'm going to call them uh, Sausage Inc. There we are. They decide to set up a pension fund for their staff. And then the pension fund, when the staff retire, will pay out benefits to the older people. So the senior citizens who have now retired. So I'll put the pensioners. You normally have to have a pension fund because local tax rules normally say it should be in a separate fund, plus the rules of equity or trust demand it. So it normally would be that the cash is kept elsewhere. The money that is transferred into the pension fund by the company is known as contributions and they are determined normally by an expert who's an actuary who will tell you what to actually put into the fund. Actuaries are very very clever people with brains the size of eight watermelons. Wow! They tell us what to put in and then on specific dates the pension plan or fund will pay out the benefits to the pensioners. So we can interested in our syllabus in the books of Sausage Inc. Now coming back to the notes, there are two types of plan, defined contribution and defined benefit. In business, defined benefit is very rare now. Depends again, it may vary from country to country. Most businesses operate defined contribution plans. And these are actually very easy to account for, we'll see later. In a defined contribution plan, the company puts an agreed contribution into a fund. So maybe it's an extra 5% on top of the employee's salary. That fund is accumulated and when the employee retires, they open the box, see what's inside, and if the fund has performed well, they'll have a comfortable retirement, and if the fund has been a disaster, they won't have a very good time at all. So these are actually for companies, they're not an accounting problem at all. Um, no different, some kind of employer tax that the employer has to pay. It's the other sort that caused the problems. If you have an auntie or uncle who gets angry about another relative and kind of snarls and says, that person's got a government pension, it's probably a defined benefit plan. It's a very different type of plan. 
This is where no promise is made about how much they will put into the fund, but a promise is made about how much is going to come out. In the defined benefit plan, they are promising that when you retire, you'll get so much money. So you know effectively again what you'll retire on, which is very comfortable. And of course, in most schemes, it, it depends on how many years you work and how much you're actually earning while you're working. The traditional model originally was that people would work at the same place for 40 years. And then if you did work there for 40 years, perhaps you then live for another 10 years. And so that'd give you, often they use 60 as a denominator. So they'd often give you 40 60th of your final salary. So most people who worked a place for 40 years would know that they'd retire on something like two thirds of their income. So that'd be comfortable for their twilight days. Life expectancy, of course, fortunately has changed. So people might live for another 30 years after retirement. So these schemes have become too expensive for companies. So most companies have reversed away from them. And many of the schemes have become insolvent, causing the actual company to come down as well. So companies are not very keen. The accounting for these schemes is more complicated. So with the examiner being the examiner, he's probably going to test us on a defined benefit plan. As I've said, though, with defined benefits, the company takes all the risk. How will the investments perform? How will salaries grow? What will life expectancy be? The company has all the uncertainty and the actuary one year might be saying, put 10 million into the plan. The next year they might say, put 50 million in because the stock market's crashed. Bit of a nightmare for the company, nice for the staff. So moving down to the accounting, the one that is simple is the defined contribution plan. There's nothing to say about it. So essentially, if you've agreed to put 50 in the plan for Beryl, you're just going to be debiting pension expense, crediting cash with the 50 when you pay it across. And you probably pay it across at the same time as Beryl gets her salary. So the contribution goes straight through the accounts. So a bit like any other employer tax that they pay. There'll be expense in the profit and loss. Very straightforward. Debit pension expense. Credit cash if they pay it at the same time as they pay the salary. Nothing else to say. The one that's excited is, is defined benefit. And there was a time when they used to account for it like defined contribution. The problem was that the profit and loss was all over the place. Because in good years, you would have high profits. In bad years, they'd have a massive expense for pensions and bad profits. It was just a disaster. And in the meantime, the staff are doing the same amount of work each year. So they decided they need to do something else. The current standard is about the fourth attempt that I've seen, and it seems to work quite well. This is what happens if it's a defined benefit plan. We'll look at an example later. The thing to understand, though, is that you won't really be doing much calculation because the calculation is done by an actuary. The actuary comes out with the numbers and you just have to put them in the, in the right place. So first of all, in the balance sheet, what do you see? The pension plan will have some assets which have been invested in equities and bonds and real estate. It'll have some liabilities. And this is the amount that's actually, again, owed to the beneficiaries. If I've been working somewhere for five years, there'll still be a liability in respect of me. If I've been working there for 40 years, there'll be an enormous liability it's an actuarial calculation. So you don't have to do these calculations, but just be aware 
The assets are measured at market value or fair value. That's easy. The liabilities is an actuarial calculation. An actuarial calculation. And it's measured at present value. So the mechanics of that aren't in our syllabus. Unless you go to the actuaries exam by mistake. And I wouldn't do that if I was you. Most of these plans are in deficit, so very often you tend to have a liability. So you can express the brackets the other way around if you like. So sometimes people write liabilities first, assets in brackets. In practice, it tends to be a liability, a bit like tax or deferred tax when you meet that later. But in the balance sheet, I show the position of the fund today. In the profit and loss, I show three principal things. The first one is the service cost. Again, the actuary will give us this number, but the service cost is the increase in liability due to employee service. So, if you've been at the factory for five years, the liability would be like this. If you've been there six years, it will get bigger. Actuarial calculation, that increase is known as service cost. Past service costs are very rare, but they also go in the PL. I'll just put it in for completeness. It's where you give a retrospective increase in benefits it happens in the exam it doesn't really happen much in life imagine if you're working at the moment you went into work tomorrow and your employer said I'm gonna give you a 5% pay rise you'd be very pleased and then if he said well I'm going to backdate it for five years you think perhaps it been on the wacky backy or something. Are you serious? It doesn't really happen, does it? Retrospective increases, but if it did happen, it's called a past service cost. So we'll be told that number. It is a line in the p &L. It's a debit, it's an expense. Two other things change normally, and that is the interest expense. The interest expense is another increase in the liability. And that's because the liability is measured at present value. I mentioned that before. So the liabilities are measured at fair value. As the discount unwinds, then that will cause another charge in the P&L. So again, it's to do, isn't it, with the time value of money. So the pension liabilities increase because the employees work, that's the service cost, and because they get closer to retirement, that's the interest cost. In the meantime, the assets will also grow, and that's because they're invested, and this is all about investment performance. Now that too causes a problem because in some years the equity and bond markets do well, in some years they don't. And this is a long-term time frame if someone is working for you for 40 years. Now actuaries are very clever people and what they say is so that the profit and loss is not distorted, to smooth things out we use a fixed interest rate and we use that fixed interest rate for both the interest expense and the return on the investment. So when we actually calculate that in practice, we use the yield on, and some people know these as double A bonds, but here's the word you might have to recognize, high yield corporate bonds 
You talked about bonds and stuff like that in financial management. The safest are government bonds, aren't they? Usually anyway. But actually, some corporate bonds are pretty safe as well. And the ones that are seen as, I've put high yield, that's actually high grade is a better word. High grade corporate bonds. So you look at those, the high grade corporate bonds, you'll just be told a rate. And that's the rate that we use to work out the financing cost. You may be asked to do that. And we, you know, so I might just make up an example for a moment of interest cost. These two numbers here, sometimes known as the net interest cost. But I promise you it won't be a hard example or we'd have to find another tutor. But if I just made up a little example of net interest cost. Imagine that you were told that the liabilities brought down in the opening balance sheet were a thousand. Imagine that you were told that the yield is 10%. Then on the debit side, on the debit side, in the profit and loss, I would end up with an interest cost of 10% of a thousand, which is a hundred. You might also be told, you will be, that the assets brought down at 800. It will always be the same yield because they use the same figure for both. So actually, the investment income is 10% of 800, which is 80. So you might be asked to do that, but it's just multiplying the yield they give you, again, by the opening asset and the opening liability. The final point is that if you've used different, if you've actually used this theoretical figure in the profit and loss, the actual figure will be different, so you do get unexpected changes. We've dealt with the soft P, we dealt with the profit and loss. Unexpected changes are dealt with in un other comprehensive income. Now, this figure you will have to calculate in the exam. So to do that, you need to learn the working. It's a logical working, but I do think it's very hard to make it up on the day and apply logic. So you need to learn it. It's a reconciliation of the opening and closing assets and liabilities. So the assets go up because the investment yields a return. The assets of the plan go up because the employing company puts in contributions. They go down because the pensioners take money out. The liabilities go up because of the finance cost. They go up because of the service cost. And again, they go down because, as, as we mentioned, the pensioners take money out, so they're no longer owed the money. So there's a difference between what you'd expect to be the asset and liability and the actual one because of stock market performance or unexpected salary growth, for example. That difference is the remeasurement component. So that's the one that we may have to calculate. And as I said, you can't really make that look working up in the exam. It's very easy. So get someone to test you on that and just make sure you know which, what goes where. You'll be given all the questions again in the scenario. What we're going to do next, though, is to have a look at an example just to apply what we've talked about so far.